Welcome, Dr. Mancini, to the Nutrition Hero Podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Dr. Brad. I'm so excited to be here. I'm a big fan, and uh, I just thank you for the opportunity to share perhaps some of my concepts that may help inspire somebody listening. Well, that's I appreciate that because that is one of the Let's put it this way. That is the ultimate reason why I was so excited to be able to have you on our show is that your message, your inspirational message, not just to doctors, but to the communities as well. I appreciate it. And I think it's awesome. I just got to say um, one of the things I did back in chiropractic school, I read this book. It's just a little book called Chicken Soup for the Chiropractic Soul. And uh, I got to ask, I never thought I'd be sitting here talking to you about this, but I just, I got to ask, where did that come from? How long did it take you to write it? Like, was it sitting in there churning for 20 years or what was going on? You know, it's so funny because if you know me personally, you know, I can't even write. I'm the worst. I mean, <laughs> this is my second language. You know, I was put back two years when I moved to the United States because I had no knowledge of the language. Uh, but I can tell you something that... Uh, it was very interesting. I happened to know the founders of Chicken Soup, and I noticed that they did two specialty books out of the 150 titles so far, and one of them was Chicken Soup for the Dental Soul, and one was Chicken Soup for the Nursing Soul. And when I read those books, I realized that, oh my goodness, you know, here we are in chiropractic, sitting with so much information, so much knowledge, so much wisdom, and an amazing process that will help most 80% of our patients get well and the public doesn't know about it. Over 90% of the public doesn't even know what chiropractic is, doesn't even understand it and has never maybe even heard of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was having dinner with one of the founders. Uh, he was speaking at a Parker seminar that I was conducting and uh, I took Mark Victor Hansen out to dinner. Never forget this. He was at the MGM and we were having a beautiful dinner. And while at dinner, I said, you know, Mark, uh, I noticed that you did these two specialty books. Would you ever consider doing a chicken soup for the chiropractic soul? I wasn't thinking about me doing it, but he said, you know, Fab, we've gotten so many chiropractors that ask us that, but Jack and I, Jack Canfield, his partner said, we don't think there's anybody out there that can do it. And then it happened, Dr. Brad, my big mouth. I said, <laughs> What if I do it? Right, right. I mean, what do I know about writing books? I mean, honestly, you should see my 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 English uh, structure. I mean, I'm the worst. I've always had assistants and secretaries and and people that always perfected my letters. So, anyways, he picks up the phone, calls Jack Canfield from the restaurant, and said, "Jack, I got great news." I'm sitting at dinner with Dr. Fab, and he just volunteered to do chicken soup for the chiropractic soul. Are you kidding me? Get him on the phone with me. I get the phone, and Jack says, Fab, I'm so excited. We've been wanting to do this book. Can you be here Monday morning? This is in Santa Barbara. This is Saturday night in Las Vegas. So I go to Santa Barbara, and Jack and I get <laughs> together. And the book took three months to do. It was the fastest book that Chicken Soup has done up to the date. Usually they take six months to a year to complete. And the reason that it was so quick is what I did. I went back after meeting with Jack and I wrote a letter, an email to many of the chiropractors out there in our database. And I said, would you introduce me to your patients, to the miracles in your practice? And he, this is the criteria for writing their story if they would like to be considered for a new book called Chicken Soup for the Chiropractic Soul. Dr. Brad, we had over 6,000 stories oh in less than a month. 6, oh, my 000. goodness. So we edited those stories. They needed to complete those 10 criteria points. The last point, you won't believe what it was. You want to know? <laughs> what? It must give you a happy tear, like Dr. Martini says. Yeah. The story must create a tear factor. And you know how difficult that can be when you read a story. So anyways, out of the 6,000, there was about 100 or so that made it to the book. Yeah. Uh, we printed the book. We never took it to the Amazon.com. We never sold it online. I just sold it through Parker Seminars. And actually, the college, the university made all the money. And I paid like three to four years of my salary with the money that we made because we sold over 400,000 of those books by the cases to the chiropractors to give to their patients. Wow. My goodness. And so... 
I, that that's crazy, by the way, that that's how that started, that ball rolling right there. Um, one of the things you just mentioned is that uh, the chiropractic school, you're referring to Parker. Um, how long were you at Parker? How did that come about? Well, you know, I was a very successful alumni chiropractor in Dallas, Texas, actually in a suburb of Dallas called Irving, Texas. And Dr. Parker had been my mentor all through school. And I had worked with Dr. Parker for two and a half years. So we became very close uh, before I opened my practice. Uh, I was on the board of the school when I became a, a practitioner. And I had given, been given every award Parker had to an alumni. Most successful alumni, most money given by an alumni, most referral of students by an alumni. I mean, most outstanding success. It was crazy. So... Uh, when Dr. Parker passed away, the board called me and said, you know, Fab, we were thinking about putting his son, Dr. Carl, as the president. Is that something you will consider? And I said, no, you know, I, why don't you try him? I really don't have an interest right now. I'm very successful. I have associate doctor uh, doing really well. I love practicing. I love, love practicing. And uh, so then they tried Dr. Carl. That didn't work out. They had to let him go. And then they call me again and they say, would you consider it? And I said, no, for a year and a half. <laughs> and then they tricked me, Brad. They called me and said that they wanted to interview me so they would know how to pick one of the 60 people that oh, they had no. already interviewed for the position. <laughs> so I do this interview for two hours. I'll never yeah. forget this. And after the interview, the gentleman that interviewed me was very famous. His name is Gil Brandt. So Gil was on our board, he's a layman, but he is on the NFL. He's considered the number one picker of players in the NFL. During draft day, you always hear Gil Brandt because he's a legend in the NFL. He was on our board, he lived in Dallas. So he interviewed me and he was so insightful, his questions, and the interesting thing is that I had answers. So I walked out of that interview saying to myself, wow, I didn't realize I knew so much about running an institution. But learning from Dr. Parker, you just take it for granted because I applied the principles and the procedures to practice, but I didn't realize it was the same thing for the school. Wow. And that was on a Friday afternoon. On Monday morning, the chairman of the board calls me and says, just want to thank you. Dr. Uh, Mr. Brandt said that you were amazing. He said there was only one person that can do the job. And I was like, great. It helped. He said, who is it? And he said, it's you. And he told me not to let you off the phone unless you say yes. So then he said, Fab, what is it going to take? You know? And I said, well, and this is the thing that I never thought would happen. I said it was if it was unanimous by the whole board. I knew they couldn't afford me. I knew that there were many great people that had applied for the position that were educators and all that. But I said, if the full board believes that I'm the right person, then I will do it. On Wednesday morning, they called me back. He said, Dr. Fab, you know, uh, uh, Rob Suppeth, Dr. Suppeth is on the phone. So I said, hey, Rob, how are you? And I said, Fab, I want you to know that the whole board is on the phone. <laughs> Where you in? Can you be there Monday morning? This is on Wednesday. No discussion of contract, no discussion of money. And I said, I will be there. My yeah. office manager is sitting next to me, and she's like, you be where? And I said, well, I think I'm the next president of Parker. She said, you can't do that. We have a big practice to run. He said, oh, don't worry. I'm going to do it part time. I'm just going to help them out. I'll be back. Six months later, Brad, my accountant calls me and says, Fab, have you looked at your numbers? And I said, what do you mean? He says, have you gone to your practice since you started Parker? And he hit me. Not once. Not once. I was so overwhelmed with building the school. The school was going through a lot of trials and yeah. financial and morale. And there's so many issues, faculty disappointment. It took everything I had. So then my accountant said, well, either you sell it or you go back to practice. So I went to the alumni office that afternoon. I told <laughs> them, could you send an, uh, an email to the alumni that have recently graduated and uh, see if they will be interested in my practice. I did a group report in my practice, so I had 27 people show up. Out of the 27, I said, guys, I really, I'm not in not any position to finance you. So how many of you have the finances to, to pay it? And there was only 10 that did. 
And out of the 10, I selected five that really fit the profile. I interviewed them all and I selected one person and I saw my practice. I never forget this. They paid me half on the 31st of December and half on the 1st to try to break the income. <laughs> uh, it was like that. It was just automatic. Uh, wow. so that was the, the simple story of what happened. And uh, I was there for 13 and a half years. And as you know, Parker right now is the most stable uh, institution in the world. Uh, we have more money than anybody in the bank. We have no debt. One out of the only two schools in the country that have no debt. And of course, wow. all the buildings have been remodeled and the branding uh, is really high. So I'm very proud wow. of the team that we put together to accomplish that. And yeah. it was an amazing journey for me. When, when was your last year there? So my last day was December 1st, 2012. And wow. at that time, uh, my publisher for my last book, The Power of Self-Healing, yes. uh, which is Hay House, had asked me to do a radio show for them. And mm -hmm. he had over a million listeners. Uh, actually, they have over 2 million listeners. And I did a radio show called Self-Healing with Dr. Fab, mm -hmm. where I brought in my concepts of forced health, but also I brought in all the top chiropractors and I interviewed yeah. them. And imagine how beautiful that is to have a Dr. Jim Tempo talking about the benefits of chiropractic care, Dr. Chestnut talking about the science behind the Dr. Right. Plaster talking about the importance of family care. Uh, I mean, I did it all and it was a huge success. And then Fox News found me. So I became Fox News Healthy Living Expert for the last almost four years. Yeah. And then I have to, after two and a half years, I dropped Hay House and I've been doing Fox News. In fact, I'll be doing Fox News uh, all week today, uh, this week, uh, for the whole nation. And the topic is um, doing the resolution. What are the states that you're most likely to meet, uh, to accomplish your resolutions? And what are the yes. states that you want? It's a new study that just came out. So anyway, so I do uh, healthy living topics. And now I'm getting to promote topics that I want to bring to the picture. So I just send them to New York and they approve it or not. And then they get all their affiliates by radio. And then whatever city I'm traveling in lecturing, because I do I, I still about 75 lectures a year. Okay. Then I do television in those cities when I'm lecturing. That is so awesome, by the way. And I appreciate the battery that you have in there. Where, where is this motivation? Like, where is your passion for this coming from? <sighs> Well, it's so interesting. Um, I wrote a new book that will be out next year. And uh -huh. I, I, I wrote five rules that I really thought to think about it. What is it, the five rules that I've learned over the last 30 years of personal development, personal growth that I what, follow? Um, what's, what's the title of the book, doctor? It's called uh, The Fab Life. The Fab Life. Uh, and, uh, yes. Uh, and you'll be hearing about it real soon. All and right. I'll send you a link, you know, later. Absolutely. The link will be in the bio for everybody listening. The link is in the bio here. So go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to make sure we got that. So when I started looking as to what has driven me mm -hmm. through this whole life of mine, 30 years of high level contributions, you know, this kid that came from Colombia, South America, didn't speak the language, was set back two years. Um, all of a sudden discovers chiropractic, falls in love with chiropractic and preventing illness, which is, I think, what we do best. We prevent illness better than anyone. We, we, we gave wellness a meaning, you know. Right. Before chiropractic, wellness was not really an issue. Chiropractic right. brought science, brought information, brought principles, brought thought processes, paradigm shifts that allow people to recognize that is far bene more beneficial to prevent an illness than to try to manage it. So anyways, um, when I started looking at that, there was one thing that happened to me when I was 16 years old. So we moved to Miami, Florida when we were 13. And when we were 16, my mom and dad asked us five boys, what do you want for Christmas? My brother Aldo, which is two years older than me, said, why don't we go to Colombia? You know, imagine at 13 years old, I hadn't seen my friends for three years, right? I'm 16 now. I'm, I'm wondering, I haven't seen my cousins. I haven't gone back to Colombia. My world was down there. It wasn't in Miami where I'm just starting fresh and learning a new language and a new culture, which is not, not easy when you're moving into right. this country. So anyways, uh, for Christmas, 
my parents gave Aldo and I a ticket to Colombia, Barranquilla, which is a hometown, same city where Shakira and Sofia Vergara come from. Okay. And uh, so we go there and my mom says to us, uh, I don't want you to stay in our house. Why don't you stay with your aunt and your uncle because they have a really nice house. They have plenty of room. You guys are going to enjoy it and they want to treat you while you're there. So we're like, okay, mom, that's great. So we went there and they picked us up at the airport. We arrived to the house and we see this line of cars parked outside. And we're like, what is all those cars? And they're like, oh, somebody must be having an event. We walked into the house and it's over 150 of our friends, family. Wow. We went ahead and invited all of our high school friends, our elementary friends, our cousins, our uncles and aunts. And they have music, they have food. It was the best evening of our lives. I mean, I promise you by 16 years old, I thought it was the best night of my life. Mm. We go to bed. My uncle goes out of town. My aunt has two children. They're in bed with her. Um, and then uh, my brother Aldo is next door, and I'm in a guest bedroom. So we're both in two different guest bedrooms. In the middle of the night, I wake up, and the back of a gun is hitting my head. Where's the safe? And I'm like, I don't know where the safe is. So I'm crying. I'm yelling. So they hit me. They tie my hands. They take my socks off and put them in my mouth because of the noise. I kept... They kept hitting me, and I kept saying, I don't know where it is. They take my socks off. They put them back in. Anyways, that went on for a little bit, and then they say, well, who's next door? And I said, my brother Aldo, he doesn't know either. We just arrived today. They wow. go next door, and Brad, without kidding you, I heard my brother Aldo yell like I've never heard, and then silence. A few minutes later, they walk into the room with their hands full of blood, and they said, we killed your brother. You better tell us where the safe is or you're going to be next. And we're going to kill everybody in this house. I'm crying. I'm pleading. You know, they take my socks off. I say, I don't know. They put my socks on. They keep hitting me. Anyways, by some miracle, the neighbors must have heard the commotion and they call the police. The police arrives. They fled. And the police comes in. They call an ambulance. They take us to the hospital. The good news my brother Aldo was alive. He had to get a few stitches in his head. Um, I was all bruised, but I was alive. And I remember sitting in that hospital bed, cold hospital bed, in the middle of the morning. And I said to myself, Brad, I said, this could have been it. At 16 years old, this could have been it. No more. Mm -hmm. And I made a promise to myself. And this is something I had not shared publicly until recently. I made a promise to live my life like if it was my last day. And ever since that day, I go to bed every night, Brad, without kidding you. Uh -huh. And I don't expect to wake up the next morning. I go to bed being so grateful that I was able to contribute. And I wake mm -hmm. up in the morning, and if I wake up, I'm so grateful that I get to do it one more day. And that's the reason why I push myself for over 30 years. Yeah. Because I do not think I'm going to be here tomorrow. And I got to do whatever I got to do today to make a difference, to impact the lives and the health of humanity, to be able to let people know that there's a higher potential in each one of us that we take for granted. You know, one time I was listening to a speech that said that the greatest treasure in the world is not in the Louvre, is not at the Vatican, is not in some beautiful museum or something in Egypt. It's actually... Yes in a cemetery mm. where there's a lot of treasures underneath that ground of people that die with their dreams still inside of them. They mm -hmm. could have been the greatest inventors. They could have been the greatest uh, achievers, influencers. You know, imagine all the people that did not fulfill their dreams. So imagine this for a minute, Brad. How would you wake up the next morning if you only think that's your last day? Imagine... Would you take time to the person next to you if you're blessed to have somebody next to you? Or would you rush out of bed, right? Would you kiss him? Would you make yeah. love to them? If you have children, would you get up early to go tickle them, wake them up real nice and gentle, maybe bake their favorite breakfast? Or would you be downstairs yelling, Johnny, you got to right. get to school. <laughs> We're late. Right. You're going to miss the bus. Right. Would you even go to work, Brad? Would you go to work or would you call in and say, hey, it's my last day. I'm taking it in. I'm going. <laughs> right. 
And if you don't wow. go to work, how would you take care of that person? How would you take care of that patient if it's the last time you will see them? Would right. you give them a half, you know, adjustment, you know, or would you actually give them the best adjustment of your life? Because that's the last adjustment they're going to get from you. You know, mm -hmm. would you, who would you call? Mm -hmm. Who would you call that you haven't called? Who would you forgive that you haven't forgiven? Who would you want to see your last day? What would you want to do? You know, people talk about having things on their bucket list. Guess what? All we got is today. If you don't yeah. do it today, don't expect tomorrow to be here. And then, you know, Eckhart Tolle wrote a beautiful book called The Power of Now, in which he brought the science behind that. But I've been yeah. living that since I was 16 years old, Brad. That's and amazing. That is my secret. That is my secret. That is, that is amazing. So thank you, by the way, for going there and like laying that out for us. Um, have you, so I don't know why, but sometimes I read it. Like if you read literature that um, was produced before the printing press, okay. If you read literature that was produced before the printing press, you're going to find out what sticks in humanity, right? Because if somebody was copying that stuff down by hand before the printing press, you know, that it must have been important, right? So that message that you're talking about right there is woven in and out from the foundations of literature. Even um, like Marcus Aurelius and, and they, that's that practice that you just had right there that you talked about living as if today was your last day and seeing that, envisioning it and being able to wake up. That is amazing to me. That is something that um, I've read about uh, over the years, but to see somebody walk in that on a daily basis, I think is amazing. So I just have to tell you that. So that's phenomenal. So your book, The Fab Life, um, is it embodying what you just communicated there? Or what's, what's your goal with The Fab Life? Well, when I wrote this book, I was inspired. I wrote it in 32 days. And... Uh, when I wrote it, I wanted to share concepts of how to influence others because mm -hmm. I get a lot of questions of people saying, Fab, how do I reach more people out there? Right. You know, with various mediums, this, this amazing podcast is reaching thousands of people because it's a medium that is very effective today. But there's other mediums out there like book writing, public speaking, getting on the media, all of that. So I wanted to teach people what I've learned over the last 30 years when it comes to influence others you know there hasn't really been a book about influence others since dale carnegie wrote wow. how to influence you know and so i wanted to write about that and then i started writing about how to achieve financial success mm -hmm. you know many people you know nine out of ten people are broke you know it's ridiculous they 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 just don't have enough resources and we live in the most abundant country in the world we live in the most abundant times in the world and why is it that so many people are right now so broke? And it's a mindset. It's a relationship that you have with money. And I wanted to write about that. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to write my best lessons on how to become the best version of yourself. And so I put a lot of personal development there. So when I did my exercise of what were the most influential lessons that mm -hmm. I've learned in my life over the last 30 years, learning from some of the biggest names in the world, having them as my personal coach, friends and mentors, um, I ended up with five rules. So I started the book with that chapter. I wow. wanted to set the precedence that when you read this book, you're going to be so filled after reading the first chapter that you can't wait to read the second one and the third <laughs> and the fourth and the fifth. And that's really pretty much. Uh, and everybody, you know, when you follow the link, you're going to get, this first chapter that I tell you about as a compliment from us, because we want you to change your life, but it's just the first chapter. And I promise you, when you read it, you're going to be like, that's enough. I've got <laughs> enough for a lifetime or even at least for the next year for sure. And make that maybe your new year resolution. My goodness. Well, thank you so much for providing that for our listeners. By the way, everybody take advantage of that. That is awesome. So Dr. Fab, what, with with the new book, um, are you hoping to communicate not just with the chiropractic industry, but are you hoping to change the world with this? Like, who's your audience with this book? Well, this book is a little bit different than the power of self healing. So, you know, the power of self healing, 
is a book that I wrote to shift the paradigm of how people see their health, their bodies, their mind, their spirits. And it's in 12 languages now. It's become one of the most wow. international bestsellers books in the world. Wow. Uh, it's so funny because I get pictures sometimes from people. And even though it's been in print for four years, it still sells every single month better. <laughs> and, uh, and it's so funny because my publisher and I talked about not even releasing a book yet because that one continues to do well. And it takes me all over the world to share the message that health <laughs> is the choice, that we need to put health as a priority in our lives. And I give you the science behind physical health, emotional health, and spiritual health. Mm. And I also give you the most amazing stories of people that were told that they would never heal and they were able to heal through a natural mean. So my goal in that book was to shift the paradigm to get that 90% of the people that are not looking for holistic health to maybe reconsider and right. add a holistic healthcare provider into their armament of doctors uh, and, lead, and, and, and take their lead. Uh, to hopefully a better, uh, better health, a better future. With this mm -hmm. book, it's, uh, I want it to be the most transformational book ever written. Uh, it's, it's simple to read. It's only 100 pages. I wrote it uh, similar to uh, Who Moved My Cheese, which is one of my favorite books of all times, and I've given thousands of them away because in a simple book of 100 pages, he teaches you a simple concept of how to embrace change in your life. Yeah. Well, I wanted this book to be about beginning for people to recognize that there's so much more for them still stored in them, that where they are today does not define them, that they are meant to be somewhere better in the future, that they, anything that they can think about, they can achieve, everything that Napoleon taught us on Think and Grow Rich, everything that so many great people like Stephen mm -hmm. Covey has taught us. I mean, I wanted to put those lessons in a very simple and practical way to apply. And at the end of every chapter, I tell you how to do it. This is the one thing that most books are missing today is that they give a lot of, a lot of great information, but they don't teach you how to do it. How do right. I go from where I am to where you want me to be? So right. after every single chapter, I give you a step-by-step -step of suggestions of how to implement this into your life in a very practical and simple way. And, uh, so this audience is a little bit different. Like I just got booked. It's not even out yet, but one of yeah. my friends here uh, is the CEO of a major company. So then they just booked me to actually do a presentation first week of February in Las Vegas to all of their executives. And it was because they wanted me to do the five, five rules. I got another <laughs> booking already in South America with the same thing. And the book is not even out. So this book is going to be not necessarily all about health. It's going to be yeah. about life. It's going to be right. about it's perfect for an entrepreneur that is looking for how to how to really advance their entrepreneurship, but also how to have balance while you create success in your life. And uh, I I'm, I'm very excited about it. I love it. So you you mentioned something in there about defining yourself or defining oneself. How do you see that, doctor? How do you define yourself or like how do you define um, like the value, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, you know, John Maxwell has taught us a great lesson, and that is that your worth is based on the value that you bring to others. And if you want to create greater worth in your life, right, if you want to earn more money, if you want to have more power, if you want to have more influence, all you have to do is wake up every day thinking about what value am I bringing to others? And I write all about this in the book because I want you to know how to create and identify the value that you bring in your, to other people because that's what's going to determine your success and that's what is also going to determine your sustainability of that success. Right. So uh, I think about that. And then I also think about, you know, the questions like how do you want to be remembered, right? How do you want to be remembered? Stephen Covey taught us many years ago. He was a dear friend. He said, begin with the end in mind. Where do you want to end up? You know, at the end of this journey, you're going to have to ask yourself two questions or one question primarily. Did I do the best that I could with what I was given, right? Mm -hmm. All of us are given something, especially in this country. In the book, I write about people like Mark Zuckerberg and, and people that, you know, Vera Wang and, and people that, uh, you know, um, 
Mary Kay for Mary Kay Cosmetics, many of these people did not find success into their 50s and 60s. Louise Hay did not open Louise Hay Publishing until she was in her 60s. The number one self-help publishing company in the world with over 38 million members, you know? Right. A lady in her 60s just wanted to bring a book out there to the people. You can heal your life and it changed people's lives. And then she said, you know, there's other authors out there that are asking me how I became so successful. So maybe I put together this little publishing company. Um, I talk about the guy that invented Snapchat. I mean, these are young people in college. Yeah. He was still in Stanford. He created it. So <laughs> I want people to recognize that it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter uh, whether you come from a foreign country or not, you know, or if you have a sexy accent like I do. But <laughs> what you need to remember is that yeah. what matters is the value that you can bring to others. And once you identify that. So for me, my mission has been to impact the health of humanity. Since, you know, I, I decided I wanted to be a doctor, I always thought big. Initially, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I wanted to go to Harvard or John Hopkins to go to medical school. And then I had a car accident that changed my life, put me in the emergency center. My friend that was a surgeon there said to me, I can give you these pills. They're anti-inflammatories, they're painkillers, or I can refer you to my chiropractor. And I think that that's gonna help you more. He called- How old were you, by the way? How old were you was, when that accident happened? I was a, a freshman, no, I was a sophomore in college. So I must have been probably 20 years old. Wow, okay. And, uh, and there, when I went to my first chiropractic adjustment, it changed my life. I interviewed over 62 chiropractors in six months. I wanted to know who they were, what they did before, how successful they were. And I fell in love, first of all, with the people in this profession. And mm -hmm. second, I fell in love with the concept of what you can do for others. You know, the concept that you can, by a simple adjustment, you can restore nerve function by providing them an understanding of lifestyle choices such as nutrition, exercise, mindfulness, that they can really live their lives to their full potential. And when yeah. they do that, they can accomplish anything they want to accomplish. So to me, that was my mission. I wanted to really help the humanity. And now it's become broader because it's not just the health of humanity, body, mind, and spirit. It's also helped the potential of every single human being out there that has the ability to make great contributions to the world at a time that we need it the most, at a time that the opportunities are the greatest we've ever seen. So let's talk about that then specifically with chiropractic, because I know that's one of your passions is driving this industry forward. Um, where do you, like, what's your message to chiropractic right now? Where do you see it going and how does nutrition fit into that? That's kind of a loaded question, but um, no. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Well, you know, I know this profession very well inside and out because not only have I been a practitioner, I've been president of a university so I understand the educational component of it. Um, then I've been a leader in all the major initiatives in the profession, whether it's state yeah. associations, national associations, world associations. You know, I was very instrumental uh, in bringing chiropractic to Mexico, mm. in which we only have 40 chiropractors there. In the first- 40? There's only 40 in Mexico? No, there were only 40. Wow. Um, until two, until uh, 2005, and then we started uh, with the help of the colegio there, we opened a school, Northwestern Lender Curriculum. I came in, I started talking to the Secretary of Health, Secretary of Education, and they funded the school. Uh, they pay and subsidize education. There is a five-year program, just like medicine, and guess wow. how much they pay, Brad, to become a chiropractor in Mexico? How much? 900 American dollars. Oh, man. They pay for it all. They don't even the do that same for the curriculum. The same curriculum that I went through at Northwestern. Yes. Oh, my gosh. One of the, and not only that, the facilities wow. are beautiful. Every building yeah. they own, they have like four, uh, almost seven or eight buildings, a million dollar building. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then in the last 12 years, Guess how many chiropractors we have graduated from these schools? There's two of them now that the government pays for. 
And guess how many wow. chiropractors we have in school right now? How many? How many? Over 2,500 chiropractors have graduated, fully licensed, instead of the, the other 40, only have provisional license. These are fully licensed to practice anywhere in the country and over 2,200 in school right now. Wow, that is phenomenal. Right, and the government still subsidizes, and now when they graduate, they put them to work in hospitals because they reduce the cost of hospitals and they increase the results of their patients. Oh my so this goodness. is a beautiful story that most chiropractors don't understand. But let me tell mm -hmm. you and answer the question to you. <laughs> so as I did my radio show with Hay House, which was every Thursday, I noticed that more people were asking me questions about lifestyle than anything else, mm -hmm. right? When Fox brought me in a year and a half later, they put the content, the title to me as healthy living expert, right? Because they knew that healthy living is what is on people's minds. Right. The public does not wake up thinking, I need a chiropractic adjustment. <laughs> right. The right. public doesn't know what chiropractic is, but we all of a sudden assume that they do. And when they don't, we take it for... Uh, personally, and we get hurt. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that the public is more ready for you than ever before, but mm -hmm. the language of the public is lifestyle, is not chiropractic. So I started getting all these questions about nutrition. And yes. I started telling people, if you're not understanding or promoting nutrition in your practice, think again. Why? Because the language of the public is nutrition. They're mm -hmm. obsessed with nutrition. Granted, Many of them want to lose weight, but it's not about losing weight only anymore. It's about preventing illness. You know, when I wrote my Power of Self-Healing book, I wrote about how whole foods can help us prevent some of the biggest chronic illnesses. An apple can prevent uh, strokes, you know. Um, artichoke can prevent cholesterol. Yes. Uh, broccoli can prevent high blood pressure. I started teaching people to understand that Food is a resource that the body needs in order to function. As chiropractors, we think that just giving that adjustment is enough, but that is not enough. That's only one part of the equation of what is the root cause of an illness. You know, mm -hmm. I believe it's one of the biggest root causes, right? Because we know the electrical system is right. the master system and it controls all the other systems, right? So we right. deal with the nervous system every day. Right. But if the cell doesn't have enough nutrients, it cannot function properly. So right. even though you give them the power to function without the proper nutrients, they can't execute their daily functions. Of course, if the cells can function, the organ won't function. And if the organ won't function, the system won't function. So right. my message to chiropractors for the last two and a half years have been, guys, please learn a little bit more about nutrition. There's so many amazing programs out there, you know, even if your school did not teach you, I'm trying to promote in the schools that they need to teach more about nutrition. Um, the second thing that most people are obsessed about is exercise, and there's so much science behind it. So the combination of exercise and nutrition, we all know it's important, but very few know how to apply it in our lives. Very few of us. In fact, we live in a time in which there's more obesity today, right? Two thirds of Americans are either overweight or obese. And for the first time, researchers have said during the Obamacare administration that obesity may be the reason why this generation of children may not outlive their parents, which is oh, unconsiderable. Absolutely. That, right? that's a, that is a travesty in itself, not on the government necessarily, but on the doctors as the teachers, as the communicators. I Man, thank you for bringing that up, by the way. No, it's, um, it's important. And we also know that nine out of 10 people are struggling with an illness. We yep. know nutrition. And in every study I see, there's definitely a, a component of nutrition. That's why I was so excited to, to be on your show and, and so grateful that you are promoting a message that is so important for providers to really understand. I spoke at the Osteopathic Association in California, the biggest in the country, and there, I had three hours of lines of people wanting to ask me more questions <laughs> because they're looking for ways to reach more people. 
You know, healthcare has put us more on a playing field than ever. Even though I know as chiropractors, some of you feel that you're not getting paid what you're worth. Let me tell you, we're in a better playing field than we've ever been. Other medical providers are struggling like we have struggled in getting new patients. Mm -hmm. The society is looking for answers that are non-traditional. So drugs or surgery not are at the highlight of their list. So it's up to us to really make sure. And, and if you remember these three things, this is something I've been teaching forever. For a patient to consider you as their provider, you must have three things. First one is they must know you. So you have to do a very good job in introducing yourself. Make sure that you mention your educational background. You know, in the latest Gallup poll, it showed that most Americans think that we're a six months to two year process of education. That has to change. Most of us have, have over eight years of education, you know? So we need to let people know that we're educated professionals. Second of all, they don't understand natural healing. So of course, they're still looking for a pill. Now, one of the things that I love about nutrition is that they're used to taking something, but now imagine taking something that their side effects are reduced by almost completely. So that's a, that's a concept that people uh, can appeal to, but they also need to not only know you, they need to like you. So you have to be likable. You have to be professional. You have to be practiced with integrity. You, you have to make sure that you communicate in a way that's fun and entertaining and all of the things that people expect. But lastly, they must trust you. Let me tell you, trust is the biggest and the hardest thing to earn from the public. So make sure that when you say something, you follow it up. Make sure that if you do have a message out there, like I do with Fox, all of my stories have a scientific evidence behind it. Why? Because we live in a world that we're gonna be scrutinized more than ever. Mm -hmm. Right now I'm pitching to Dr. Phil to be a regular on the doctors because I want to be the one that tells them the natural solutions to any topic they're talking. Why? Because I have the credentials to do that. That's right. 80 to 90 percent of Dr. Oz is all natural advice, but he's a medical doctor. He has not been trained on this, but he knows how to put shows together and they're entertaining. They're very visual and the mm -hmm. public loves it. But that should be us. We should be doing that on our little well, practice every week. Let's talk about that then, because I understand that you're working on a talk show. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. All right. So what what is the talk show? Is it going to be an extension of your book, The Fab Life, or is it going to be an extension of self-healing? No. The, the, yeah, it's going to be all of it. What I did is that over the last two years, I've been offered to do my own talk show, but I uh -huh. had to move to L.A., and I have a son that is about to graduate from high school, so I wanted to stay in Dallas until then. Now that he's about to graduate in May, I went back to the networks, CBS, NBC, C, uh, ABC, uh, CNN, all the networks that I've been speaking over the last five years and doing yep. segments for them. And I realized that they all want another Dr. Ross. They all want information that is entertaining and health driven mm -hmm. because the public is obsessed with it. Um, I wanted, uh, so I created a format for a show very much like what other successful shows have, but very unique. And that's what networks want. Networks want to show that, show me a track record. You know, when Judge Judy became the number one talk show uh, in America, then every network created a judge something, right? Right. When Dr. Phil started, then of course now you have Dr. Ross, right? Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, they're different. But yet again, they've both been very successful. One handles more mindset issues, behavior issues. The other one manages more natural, holistic uh, information. Right. Let's put it that way. And uh, so all the networks are looking for, okay, who's going to be my Dr. Ross? But they haven't found them. Why? Because there's not too many doctors that are camera ready, media ready. You know, right. I've been mentoring people out there that want to get out there and write books and get on the media because I need help. We need an army of us providers out mm -hmm. there hitting the media every week, hitting the best-selling list every week, hitting uh, the stages of the most reputable uh, environments out there. So that way they get to see that there is so many of us because no matter how many of us they are, remember, we're fighting a tremendous adversity where 90% of the people are brainwashed 
to think that a drug is the answer to everything. And I'm not saying a drug doesn't have its benefits. I'm just right. saying it's not the answer to most of the chronic illnesses that we have today. Agreed. I can't, I couldn't agree with you more. And by the way, I just want to say that's a big deal that you'd honor your kid enough to make sure that you stay planted until he's ready to be done. So I just, that's, that's pretty awesome. Just so you know. So um, well, I just think it's important not to create more change. Uh, right. You know, moving somebody, high school has become a little different than when you and I went. Uh -huh. It's a, it's a very emotional time. It's a very bonding time. Mm -hmm. And I know that having to move in the middle of your last year or in your last year, I mean, I, I, I just could not do something like that. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing is that the networks are fine because I'm still so young. I just turned 52, right? I'm starting to look credible now, even though people <laughs> say, hey, you're so young, you know? Uh, so the timing is not an issue. But for me also, I wanted to give my full heart into it because most yeah. of my friends that are daytime talk show hosts, they tell me it's one of the most demanding uh, roles that you'll ever have because of the intensity of ensuring yeah. that the content is relevant, that having enough content out there for the public, listening to what the public is needing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many factors to it. So, But I have great coaches and great friends of mine that are doing it. So they're guiding me through this process. And uh, I'm just really excited because I know that it was definitely my next step. I yes. just, um, I just, so what I did over the last few years is I do a lot of segments, not only on Fox, but I do NBC, CBS, ABC, CW33, CNN, and then I do all the Spanish channels, Televisa, Univision, Telemundo. Um, Why? Because I'm bilingual. So yes. it's a beautiful thing. In fact, for NBC, I'm pitching two shows at the same time, one in English, one in Spanish. It's never been done, but they bought the sec or the. It used to be the second, but they're tied now. It's number one, uh, biggest network, uh, Hispanic network in the United States called Telemundo, mm -hmm. and they love my idea. So I'm meeting with them in January to discuss it more. But I, I'm testing some other things with CBS too because I know that I'm I'm very just very excited about the opportunity to share this, but also remember to bring these stories to life to bring guests like I did for my radio and imagine bringing some of the amazing doctors in our circle that all they need is a bigger platform to reach more people because within chiropractic, they're legends, but they're not reaching the people. <laughs> I always said, you know, it's yeah. such a shame that we go to a chiropractic event like a Parker event and you have them one by one, some of the best speakers in the world that are chiropractors and mm -hmm. the public doesn't get to hear them at all. Yes. Thanks to me, you know? So maybe after Sabado Gigante, Dr. Fabrizio Mancini. There we go. So I love it. <laughs> <I'm not so. laughs> I love it. So, so uh, coming up, what is what kind of schedule do you hold for yourself? And how is that going to change when this talk show gets uh, the recording underway? How, how is life going to change for you? So my goal right now over the next six months is to be pretty much everywhere, on TV, on TV primarily. So mm -hmm. Good Morning America, The Today Show, Rachel Ray, all of those shows. Why? Because you're building a platform. People right. are, are used to seeing me on Fox News. People are used to seeing me on CBS, NBC. But I need to be present everywhere. So my publicists and I are working on a plan to get me in all of those shows and to have different topics. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm wanting to be a regular on a major show out there uh, because that builds a platform. Yes. That's how Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz did it. They had Oprah as the platform, yes. and after two or three years, their following was big enough to sustain their own show. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's another one of my goals, and and I'm pitching all of this to the to the stations right now. And then mm -hmm. thirdly is to continue to public speak out there because uh, I believe that you know when you get out there and invited to some of the biggest events out there to speak to with some of the biggest names out there, it brings a lot of credibility. So I want to keep, you know, because nowadays they record you on a, on a stage of like you got 10,000 people in the room, but then yes. you got a million that saw the, the show because right. they record you and post it out there through social media. Uh, right. There's amazing podcasts like this one that I can get my message out there. Uh, there's uh, so many mediums out there. And I probably I have eight books on my list of books to write. So can you imagine? Wow. I've written five best-selling books. This, yep. And I got eight on my list. So... 
Uh, I got a lot of work ahead of me. <laughs> you're going you're to have to have a massive team of people that just write down everything you're taking care of here. That's phenomenal. So I love it. So um, what kind of lessons are you teaching your kid as he's getting ready to graduate here? So the first thing is to choose a career they love. It's one of the rules that I live by. I love being a chiropractor. Everywhere I go, I tell people I'm a chiropractor. You know, some of the times people say, oh, don't mention that. And many, some of the chiropractors that have crossed over, they kind of play it down. But to me, I'm proud to be a chiropractor. And chiropractic gave me a foundation that I'm sharing with many people out there. Number two is you got to find, I mean, you got to find. So the first rule is you got to find something you love, something you're passionate about. So since eight years old, Gianni, my oldest, wanted to play tennis in a D1 school, top five. So he got to fulfill that dream. So he's been playing for TCU for the last two years. That's They're third great. in the nation the last two years. They won the Big 12, so they got the big rings and all of that. <laughs> this summer he came to me and said that I changed my mind. I want to do electronic music. So he was DJing on the side for fun, and he became very big DJing. But then he found out my second lesson is once you discover what your passion is, you got to find a business model to allow you to support your lifestyle. Now, what I teach is your lifestyle is different from everyone else. You know, happiness, I did a study um, from Cambridge University for Fox News that they interviewed over 500,000 households, 500,000, and they found out that after $75,000 of net income, your happiness doesn't change, mm. right? After 75,000. So lifestyle doesn't have to be so much money. Right. right. It has to be just that you're happy with what you do have, mm -hmm. you know, and most of the time, if you live in a one bedroom studio, right, paying maybe a thousand dollars in rent, but you're always thinking about the two or three bedroom or you're thinking about that house, then you're not going to be happy. Right. Instead of thinking about the homeless that is sleeping out there tonight or sleeping or somebody out there that's having to room with five or 10 people in an apartment because they don't have a place to sleep or somebody that had to move back to their mother or father's home because they don't have a place of their own. You see, so no matter where you are in life, you're always going to find someone that will be so grateful to have what you have. So I tell my kids, what is that lifestyle for you? Do you want to live in $50,000 a year, $100,000 a year, a million dollars a year, $10 million a year? Because unless you know what that is, you'll never be happy. You'll always be wanting more. You'll always be comparing yourself to other people. And that's one of the reasons why so many people, even though they're millionaires, they're the most unhappy people you'll ever meet, right? <laughs> my dad always taught me a lesson. My dad yeah. used to tell me, money only makes you more of what you already have. Right. So be happy with what you have, be. So to me, the second lesson I taught him is once you discover your passion, you got to find someone to pay you to do it. You got to find a business model that would allow you to support your lifestyle. So then he started recognizing that DJs do well, mm -hmm. but producers do great. <laughs> That's when you get into the millions of dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So he started then producing his own music, but uh, traded in the DJ equipment into a production equipment, thousands and thousands of dollars. And now he's producing his own music with the same passion that he had for tennis, six that's to seven awesome. a day, nonstop, because that's, that's awesome. what it takes to really succeed today. It's not easy. It takes passion, but when you love it, it never feels like work. So that's that, my, my, my lesson to him. That's that's awesome. I um, That right there is, that, if people that are listening here on the Nutrition Hero Podcast, write that down, what he just said, especially about money, right? Money makes you more of what you are. It's the great magnifier. Like, Take that to heart. That is phenomenal. So, Dr. Fab, where are we going to see you next? Where are we going to see you next? Well, you know, I'm still going to be doing uh, somewhere between 15 and 20 events in chiropractic, primarily because I want to bring to chiropractors a message of how to reposition themselves, what the public is looking for, to look for the opportunities rather to be on survival mode with so many brothers and sisters are just barely surviving. And that's never meant to be. 
you know, if, if Didi Palmer was alive or even uh, BJ Palmer was alive or even Dr. Parker, they would look back and say, guys, this profession was never meant to be on survival. If you're on survival, it means you're not bringing up value to your community. So let's think about what that is. Are you teaching the community what chiropractic is? Are you meeting them where they are with nutrition? Are you creating environments where they can come and be a part of your environment? I mean, come on, this is not rocket sciences. We know the steps to take to be successful, but unfortunately, most of us are not willing to take them. Then I do about 60 plus or, I mean, 50 plus lectures outside of chiropractic. So I do corporate America. Mm -hmm. I do wellness events. I do many of the others. And primarily because I want to bring those people into on the understanding of why what we do matters and why health should be a priority in their lives. But also now I'll be talking about success mindfulness. I'll be talking about some of the things that we're sharing you and I through this last book that I wrote. Um, and then of course, a lot of TV, a lot of radio, uh, and, uh, and probably more books coming starting <laughs> next year. Uh, well, I'm, excited. I'm looking forward to it. I'm yeah. seriously, I'm looking forward to it. I, Today, just in this uh, time that we've been able to spend together, I appreciate, number one, the attention, right, that you're spending. Number two, the just the intention that you're laying out there, the, the groundwork for where you're headed, I think is phenomenal. And I wanted to make sure that we got to honor you for that today as well. So um, mm -hmm. thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Fab. And again, just everybody, thank you. Go to the link that'll be provided in the bio here below. Learn to get on the pre-sale list for this book, right? The Fab Life and look for Dr. Fabrizio Mancini on a network program near you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so exactly. doctor, thank you so much. I appreciate your time today, sir. And oh, it's been a real you. pleasure. Thank you so much. So. And uh, thank you for all you do also and for bringing this message of, of wellness and nutrition to the world. Uh, because especially many of us that are providers are there and are keep looking for ways to increase our practices, it's already here. All you have to do is tap in, do what you're being suggested to do, model the behaviors of other successful people, and you'll find that you too were meant for great success. Don't ever question that. Phenomenal, doctor. So, well, thank you very much.